Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How are you all doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of Amos 9, 9. And we don't get into Amos very often. I like that these devotions go through uh, many of these of the books, of the, even the more obscure books in the Bible that uh, don't get addressed very often. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a save, yet shall not least grain fall upon the earth. So in the New King James, it says, For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations, as grain is sifted in the save, yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. Very interesting. Let's read this in this context. Go ahead and start in verse 1 on this one. The destruction of Israel. I saw the Lord standing by the altar, and he said, Strike the doorposts, that the thresholds may shake, and break them on the heads of them all. I will slay the last of them with the sword. He who flees from them shall not get away, and he who escapes from them shall not be deceived, delivered. Though they dig into hell, from there my hand shall take them. Though they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. And though they hide themselves on top of Carmel, it would be Mount Carmel. From there I will search and take them. Though they hide from my sight at the bottom of the sea, from there I will command the serpent, and it shall bite them. Though they go into captivity before their enemies, from there I will command the sword, and it shall slay them. I will set my eyes on them for harm and not for good. Pretty powerful speech. The Lord of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell there mourn. All of it shall swell like the river and subside like the river of Egypt. He who builds his layers in the sky and has founded his strata in the earth. Interesting state, statement there about how the earth is made. Do a little lesson into how the stratas are laid out. You start to learn more about the flood. Who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. Are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me? O children of Israel, says the Lord. Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt? The Philistines from Kaftor and the Syrians from Kir. From Kir? Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. And you remember what we read in Zechariah. One third of the house of Israel shall be saved. Where does that one third come from? Jacob. Here in Amos, we have another confession of the Lord, another promise. Yet I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. He's going to destroy the rest of Israel. For surely I will command and will sift the house of Israel among all nations as grain is sifted in the save. Yet not the smallest grain shall fall to the ground. So Israel's got a lot coming. Uh, this seven-year tribulation is going to be their sifting. Heavy-duty sifting. Heavy-duty sifting. And yet, they will all be destroyed except for the house of Jacob. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say the calamity shall not overtake nor confront us. Interesting statement. I bet that's a statement that will be made in the very near future. And then he gets into the restoration of Israel. On that day, I will rise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. That's us. That's us, says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows seed, the mountain shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them, and they shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is a 
This is a future prophecy. A future prophecy. Very powerful one. And we know when that's coming. Tribulation. And then after the millennial reign. Every sifting comes by divine command and permission. Satan must ask leave before he can lay a finger upon Job. Nay, more, in some sense, our siftings are directly the work of heaven. For the text says, I will sift the house of Israel. Satan, like a drudge, may hold the save, hoping to destroy the corn. But the overruling hand of the master is accomplishing the purity of the grain by the very process which the enemy intended to be destructive. Remember what I've told you guys? Remember what I've told you about all this stuff that happens? Oh, Satan may want it to be something bad to us, but what does the Lord do? He makes it work for the good of those that love him. He takes those events, he takes those processes, those troubles, those trials, and he turns them into something that is to our benefit. This is why we can't look at the superficial meaning of these things. We must look deeper. Because it's the hand of God that is working these things for a much more important future than what we can see. Do we have faith to believe it? Precious, but much sifted corn of the Lord's floor. Be comforted by the blessed fact that the Lord directeth both flail and save to his own glory and to thine eternal profit. We just said that. The Lord Jesus will surely use the fan which is in his hand, the winnowing fan, and will divine, or sorry, divide the precious from the vile. All are not Israel that are of Israel. See, the synagogue of Satan is there. All are not Israel that are of Israel. The heap on the barn floor is not clean provender, and hence the winnowing process must be performed, if the save true weight alone has power. In the save true weight alone has power. Husks and chaff, being devoid of substance, must fly before the wind, and only solid corn will remain. Observe the complete safety of the Lord's wheat. Even the least grain has a promise of preservation. God himself sifts, and therefore it is stern and terrible work. He sifts them in all places, among all nations. He sifts them in the most effectual manner, like as corn is sifted in a save. And yet, for all this, not the smallest, lightest, or most shriveled grain is permitted to fall to the ground. Every individual believer is precious in the sight of the Lord. Remember what it says? I won't break the bruised reed. I won't quench the smoking flax. A shepherd would not lose one sheep, nor a jeweler one diamond, nor a mother one child, nor a man one limb of his body, nor will the Lord lose one of his redeemed people. However little we may be, if we are the Lord's, we may rejoice that we are preserved in Christ Jesus. And there are a great many of us who are struggling with that very concept. Well, you must come to a place where you believe the promises of the Lord. I won't let you go. If you're mine, if you are engraved on the palm, not your name is engraved, you are engraved on the palm of the Father's hand, you're not lost, and you're not going to be lost. He won't forget you. He won't misplace you. He won't lose you. He has just placed you somewhere where you'll be safe. And though we may go through trials and trouble, though we may see terrible things, and a lot of people today are really fearing some of the things that they're seeing as Christians. Are we going to see any of that? Are we going to see any of that? Are we going to see any of this? We don't know. And there's not a person on this earth I can tell you they know. Unless the Bible specifically tells us this. We don't know. What we do know. Is that these things are going to take place. What part we may play in this? Technically is irrelevant to us. It's all up to God. Whether we see it or not. Whether we specifically and personally partake in these things are not irrelevant. They're irrelevant because we are saved in him. Our salvation not only is a past tense, but a present tense, and not only a present tense, but a future tense. Which means that the he called us before the world began, past tense. He saved us when we were born in this life, when our appointed time came, present tense. And there is a future eternity waiting for us, future tense, all at the same time. And so these things that are happening, we're just passing through. It's just, it's irrelevant. It's like when you're passing through Fredericksburg here in Texas and they're having the Peach Festival. That Peach Festival starts 
proceeds and ends, irrelevant of whether you're there or not. Yet, you might come in the middle of it and pass through the town and see everything that's going on. By the way, the peaches out there are phenomenal. And you may pass through the town of Fredericksburg and see all the stuff going on. And then you pass through, it is irrelevant. It's still going to happen. This world and everything in it is still going to proceed on regardless of whether we're here or not or whether we're active or not or whether what we're doing or not. Because we are now, by divine grace, separated out from that. This world will continue to do what it's going to do. We're not going to stop it. We're not going to change it. We're not going to win the kingdom for Jesus like the charismatics keep trying to say. It's not going to happen. His kingdom is not of this world. We're just living out the lives we've been given. We're living out into our appointed time to go, whether it's by our natural death or whether it's by the rapture of the church. And so what happens in this world technically, technically is irrelevant to us. We just live this life and move on. But along the way, incredible things happen. Terrible trials and tribulations come along. And here's what's so unique about this. And this is what excites me about this. This is what makes me pay more attention to myself to make sure that I'm walking where I should be. Is that when those things happen, who shines the brightest in those events? The Christian. Remember all the stuff that happened in Afghanistan? And they left all those people there, said, oh no, we're going to get everybody out. And then they, but they didn't. What happened? The greatest revival in the history of the nation of Afghanistan happened. And more people became Christians than had ever done in that, in that country. That was the design of God. That was a work of God. They were left there on purpose so that they would hear the gospel. God worked a miracle within that terrible situation. The same thing happens anywhere else. There's a massive natural disaster. What happens? All the Christians show up. All the Christians show up to help. All the Christians that are in the, the situation rise up and people see it. One of the big hurricanes we had here in the fairly recent past. News didn't talk about it. Well, there was a particular individual in one of the cities that had a very large laundromat. And he really put a lot of time and money into this and put industrial machines in there. But it was a very big laundromat. He went through and set all the machines so they didn't need any coins and said, y'all can come in here and wash your stuff. Knowing it was probably going to damage his equipment, knowing that he was going to lose a lot of money, he set them all to free so that people could come in and wash their stuff and said, y'all can come use these things, no cost. News never talked about him. You know who the first people were to hit Louisiana when a couple of them big uh, hurricanes hit and tore everything up and flooded it? Christians. They were the ones that showed up first with water and supplies, showed up there to help. You know who made it to... Houston first, when Harvey went in there and flooded the whole place. You remember all the boats and the Louisiana Navy showed up and all? You know who made it there first? And they were within those group, the Christians. They were there first. They were on ground first. The, in these situations, the Christians become the shining light. They're there offering comfort. They're there helping. They're there using of what they have to try to be a benefit to others. You know who was going door to door in Wuhan when Wuhan shut down in 2020 and nobody could even walk out the door? You know who was going door to door taking masks, water, and Bibles to them? The Christians in Wuhan. Nobody else was going out in the street. They were. And if they had the ability to get food, they were taking whatever food they could to them people. Door to door. You know what they got for it? Jail. <laughs> but, but in these, all these situations, the Christians shine up to the surface. The Christians rise up and step out. The true born-again believers. And so these things that happen expose us. What the Lord is doing here in Amos is exposing those who are truly his. Right now, you can't tell. We don't know. Go over there and look in Israel. You can't tell who's who. But when this time of testing comes, the ones who are his will be revealed. And in that same situation, those that get saved in the tribulation will also be revealed. And they will rise to the top and shine like lights. We will become salt of the earth. 
While we're here now enduring the things that we're enduring, we should be doing the same thing, rising up and being the Christians we're called to be, being the Christians we're supposed to be or that we say we are, and be salt and light. So in those trials and tribulations, in those troubles that happen, that's your moment. That's your moment to shine. That's your moment to be who the Lord is making you to be. That's your moment to stand and be counted among the brethren. Those trials and tribulations are for a purpose. Not to torment us, not to wear us down. Though that's what the world thinks, that's what they want you to think. But that's those opportunities, that's those open doors for us to show people who we really are. And to set things right, even if it's in a temporary sense. It's for the glory of God. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and to sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you so much for this holy, wonderful word, and thank you for this devotion. I thank you that we have the written representation of our Lord Jesus Christ here with us, accessible at all times, but I fear that we don't access it as much as we should. Because if we did, we would know these things. We would start to get a greater grasp on what the purpose is for us to still be here. What is the purpose for us to be here? Well, first of all, prophecy has to be fulfilled. And second of all, that's what it was deemed whenever the Lord made his prayer. Father, I don't, I ask that you don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one while they're here. Very easily, you could have just said, as soon as one gets saved, I'm taking them out. But then who would preach the gospel? Who would be the light? Who would be the salt? Who would glorify you in the earth? And so we find Psalms that talk about this and Proverbs. The point is, is that after being saved, we need to be here and we need to endure those things because then we show the, your glory, the glory of God, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in us, the manifestation of his wonderful gift of salvation in us. When these trials and tribulations come, our greatest opportunities to shine are in the worst situations. Our greatest opportunities to help come in the worst possible trials and tribulations, whether they're on us specifically or on an area. We become salt and light. That's our opportunity. And yet we miss it because we get too caught up in our own agenda. We get too caught up in our own self-pity because we think we're not being used by you or not good enough. And we desperately want to be used by you, but we spend so much time trying to force it. Instead, we need to just sit back and let you work and wait for our moment. And then when we get our moment, like I told Nina yesterday, when we get our moment, that we, especially the moment we ask for, step out in faith. As long as we're willing, you, you will make us able. We just have to be willing. And then you work wonderful miracles through those actions. We glorify you in what we are doing and show the people around us what a real Christian is because all they ever see is all that nonsense on TV. All that stuff that you see people doing, they're claiming to be a Christian and they go and they do stuff that a Christian should not be doing and then it just gives them more ammunition against us. But these are our opportunities. These times of trouble, that's when we get to say, that's not a Christian. This is what we do. And we get to share your truth with him. And what's great is that we even get to preach to ourselves and each other at the same time. Amazing. Most people don't know that when the 2016 election came, 10,000 Christians descended on Times Square, blocked traffic and shut it down for a half hour and had a massive prayer vigil. Most people don't know. Well, I think only one or two news agencies covered it briefly. They shut it down for 30 minutes. 10,000 Christians. How amazing. That was our opportunity. And look what they did. Amazing. Well, Father, in the trials and tribulations we have in our lives, I pray that you make us to be salt and light in those situations. To know what needs to be done to stand up and do it. Whether we have the ability or not is irrelevant, but that just, we'd we, we be willing to do it and then you make us able. You give us the ability. Because we may go throughout most of our lives and never find opportunities from our viewpoint to glorify you, to bring honor to the kingdom, to bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ. But 
All we need is that one moment to glorify you in our actions, to be doers of the word, that one moment. And technically, we don't even need that. We just need to live the rest of our lives for you, to walk in integrity, to live in truth and faith, believe and trust you in, in all things and for all things. So, Father, I ask that you do that. I ask that you get out of it. Get out of there. That's not for you. Go away. Father, I ask that you help us to recognize these situations when they come. These opportunities so that we may glorify you in these trials and tribulations of our personal lives and even of the areas that we live in. Dog is bored looking for something to do. That we may have an opportunity to show who we really are in the worst possible scenarios. But you know what, Father? If that opportunity doesn't arise for us, then so be it. And let us live every day for you and no matter what. But if there's an opportunity for us to do something for you, if there's an opportunity for us to, to do something for another, do a, a good work. Lord, I pray you work that through us. Give us the ability to do it. And if we're not willing, make us willing so that we may be the Christians we keep saying we are. Every day, may we live for you in and out of trials and tribulations, in and out of disasters. Every day, may we live for you and so that people will see that so that they won't just see us as a Saturday or Sunday Christian, but instead they'll see us as a, a lifelong Christian. Just maybe, just maybe the door to evangelize will open and we can share the gospel and lead somebody to you for salvation or at the very least plant seeds. But we know, Lord, that there are no things that we need to do to please you other than faith. There are no things that we need to do to that are, that are going to help you. We just need to be faithful. And you will work all things for our betterment. Do we have faith? And are we believing? I pray that is so. And that, that faith and that believing is directed directly to you. Directly to our Lord Jesus Christ. May we walk in truth always believing, loving each other, caring. And doing whatever it is you've given us to do. So that when you come, you find us doing it. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. And thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. It's very interesting that it is only when the Lord does something very incredible, like what he describes in Amos here, that we start to rise up and manifest. It's like he, you, you take and if you have stuff that's that's lighter, um, well, here, here's a great example. When you were, we were kids, they would have this experiment. We brought a big old mason jar. We put gravel, sand, dirt, grass, whatever, and then fill it with water, put the lid on it, and shake it and set it down and watch it settle. And to see the different layers, the strata, which is amazing that they mentioned that name is, to see the strata form. And it gives us a sense of, of how this stuff develops and how it works geologically. But the same type of analogy works here when things start getting crazy the lord stirs everything up and what happens the rock anchors to the bottom and everything else lighter sits on top if you go and you ever see the process of um processing grain the old way the old jerusalem way the old israel way they would take a board a board called a tribulum by the way with a rope attached to it, and they would walk along and they would, with one foot, they'd mash it and it would crack the kernels. So the kernel of wheat would stay, but the chaff, the outer shell, would pop off. And somebody would walk in with this great bit. It looks like the, the, or, the Asian, the Oriental fans that you see the geisha girls using. And it's a great big one, though, made out of straw. And they'd walk through and they'd 
wave it back and forth and it would blow all the chaff off to the side and usually there was a drop off there so it would blow out and the wind would catch it and take off because it was super lightweight but they would just wave it real hard and it would blow that out and the only thing left would be it would even blow the dust away but the only thing left would be the kernels of wheat and they would gather them up they'd gather them up they'd put them into a safe and they'd sift them to get any sand any dirt any rock anything out of it sift them and if any little ones fell out, they were caught and picked up. So that every grain was saved. It's a lot of work to get that stuff. But you notice what it takes to get to the finished product. Trials and tribulations. The tribulum, the board that cracks the kernel. The trial of the winnowing fan. To get away, get the, to get rid of the chaff. What shines forth when that happens? The beautiful kernel of wheat that can be made into all kinds of things. It's all analogies. It's all examples. And it's all pictures of what the Lord is doing in each one of our lives, in our salvation, in our sanctification. And is what he's going to continue to do until it is time for us to go. When we start to understand this process, it makes it so much easier for us to recognize when it's happening and to be accepting of it. Lord, I see what's happening. Show me what I can do, make me to grow, teach me so that I may glorify you in this. The end result is a child of God prepared for heaven, prepared for sonship. Amazing. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. Don't be too quick. Don't be too quick to want to run headlong into troubles. Instead, just wait on the Lord. He'll bring to you what needs to come. He's already prepared the path for you, and he will bring you out victorious if you walk in faith in him and trust him in all things. See you in the next video.